Hi, and welcome back to chapter nine. We'll do the second part of um, disorders of the immune system. And let's start with autoimmune disorders. So normal defenses become self-destructive. Let me get my little laser pointer. Perceive self as foreign. It perceives somebody's tissue as something foreign that the antibody should start fighting against. Some of the causes, we're just not really sure why somebody has autoimmune disorder. There certainly are theories. They tend to affect women more often than men, especially a young, younger type of a woman. Can affect any tissue in the body. Um, autoimmune disorders typically have remissions and exacerbations. Stress frequently can trigger exacerbations. Diagnosing these are difficult because it's often just a roll everything else out and then, and then roll in autoimmune disorders. So treatments include multiple types of medications, depending on what the autoimmune disorder is and managing stress, which again can, can contribute to an exacerbation. So some autoimmune diseases, um, Guillain-Barre, fibromyalgia, a thyroidosis with their Hashimoto's for hypothyroidism or Graves' disease for hyperthyroidism. It's an autoimmune disorder of the thyroid, psoriasis, eczema, uh, peripheral neuropathy, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, type 1 diabetes, um, just not sure of the cause, Rheum rheumatoid arthritis, any type of those, polymyxia, rheumatica, ankylizing spondylosis, all those different seronegative spondyloropathies were, are all included, uh, hemolytic anemia and, and lupus. There's multiple. You can look up in the list. It's 100 times longer than this. So let's talk a little bit about lupus. SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, erythematosus being red, chronic inflammatory autoimmune disorder that can affect um, the connective tissue. Um, really, it should say can affect vessels and connective tissue. The B cells activated for unknown reasons to produce antibodies and antigens, and then these combine to form the immune complexes. These immune complexes become abundant, and then they start to fight the body's own tissue by depositing themselves. Typically, um, for for lupus, heart, depends in the, in those vessels, lungs, the skin, the joints, anything that has connective tissue, because it's is it a connective tissue disorder, and then those complexes just fight the body wherever they are deposited. So they have multiple symptoms. So diagnosing criteria for or more of the following, and sometimes it just it just it just kind of hard to diagnose autoimmune disorders. And there's just multiple types of symptoms that some people have and some people don't. One of them that's very specific, not everybody gets, but it's a classic test question: butterfly rash over the cheeks of the face. You can kind of see in this original picture right here. That's kind of a classic sign of lupus, the butterfly rash on the face. Any type of photosensitivity or skin rashes, ulcers, joint inflammation, they have, because of those complexes, they deposit very readily in the joint. So they tend to have arthritis types of pains. Because those complexes are in the joints, it causes the inflammatory response and the pyrogens come out. They have fever and pain and they feel fatigued all the time. Um, some arthritis, maybe some inflammation if it's deposited in the heart or in the, the lung area, they get inflammation, so they have pleuritis, pericarditis, and they love to um, deposit, those complexes love to deposit in the kidney areas, and probably one of the most classic um, complication or the most common major complication that lupus patients have are renal abnormalities or renal insufficiency. So at least 50% or more of patients with lupus do have, they do suffer for, from some kidney damage because of that. So prognosis improves with early diagnosis and treatment. Diagnosis, um, again, these are just inflammatory markers that are not specific to lupus. They're just specific to inflammation and, and just try to rule other things out. So the CRP, um, which is the um, uh, protein, um, the C-reactive protein, It's, it's released in the blood, I think, in like in within a couple hours, 
after there's some tissue injury. So that, that's all it's really indicative of, but it certainly can be an inflammation marker. So some facts about a C-reactive protein, the higher the CRP level, the more inflammation in the body. That's helpful. CRP is not specific. It isn't unique to one disease. It just signifies inflammation. CRP tests can help monitor disease progress and flares if they go up for inflammation and down. Um, and the other, the other test right here is this, this sed, SED rate or ESR, sedimentation rate, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And the SED rate measures how quickly red blood cells sediment or settle. And they should be settling slowly. And if they settle faster than normal, um, which would be which be a higher number, that indicates inflammation. A high SED rate signals high levels of inflammation in the body. Most people with an autoimmune disease will have a high SED rate, but the test can't help diagnose a specific disease. Same concept as that. The SED rate test can help evaluate how well your treatments are working. Again, as the inflammation occurs, SED rate and CRPs go up. As the inflammation is maintained and managed a little bit better, these two tests go out, go down. So treatment, there really is no cure. Some stress management, health promotion behaviors, frequent rest, um, pharmacologic treatment to relieve some symptoms, and certainly I should have here anti-inflammatory medications for sure. Next, we're going to talk about transplants. Um, transplants, as far as like this is a, a kidney right here, organ or tissue transplant. So a graft, a graft is any tissue that has been taken from one part of the body and used in another part, making the best match of tissue antigens is the core for success. So best match or else success is going to be poor. Donor sources, sources may be living or a cadaver. So per, perfect example of a living source would be somebody who donates one of their kidneys somebody who donates blood for bone marrow transplants, or it can be from somebody who has deceased, like a heart, lung, eyes, harvesting organs. Graft types, autograft, same person. It's, 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 an, it's the tissue or organ that come from the same person. And you're probably familiar with autologous blood. Sometimes somebody who's having surgery will donate their own blood weeks prior to their surgery. So if they've had to have a blood transfusion, they get autogenous blood and they get their own blood. So it's the same person. An isograft is from an identical twin. An allograft is from the same species. And this is the most common. We typically get our organs and tissues from a human for a human. But a xenograft would be something that it comes from a different species like a pig valve or a cow valve or, or, or a baboon heart or something like that. Excellent matching is key. They have to have an excellent match or the body would reject it. So let's talk about transplant reactions and rejections and the causes. Um, so we can be talking about tissue transplant, organ transplant, bone marrow transplants, and what are some of the causes the donor organ may not work well? And again, trans, transplant success is highly correlated with the best possible tissue match. Another cause could be non-adherence. So they have to take immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of their life. And sometimes people are non-compliant with their medications. And then that's going to cause rejection of the organ or tissue. Rejection is based on timing, and there's three kind of time frames. One is hyperacute, which is an immediate response. And basically, anybody who immediately rejects an organ, um, the organ never got perfused. The kidney never got perfused in the transplant. It became necrotic, and it never worked to begin with. Acute is fairly common, four days to three months. Um, and chronic is the most common, which is four months to a year. 
And of course, if somebody is not adhering to medications years out, it certainly will contribute to a transplant rejection. Um, just, I don't think I have another slide about symptoms. No, I, I should have added it here. Just as far as like, what are symptoms that somebody might be having? Probably the best symptom is the actual organ not working well. For example, the kidney's not working, urine output is going to go down, creatinines are going to go up. Um, pain at the site, pain where they where they where they have their their organ, general flu-like symptoms. Those are some things that can be be symptoms. Um, but again, the organ failing is generally the first kind of clue that they're having some transplant rejection or reaction. Rejection reaction types. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah. All right. So, so the type, I just put type 4 because these are type 4 hypersensitivities. So I put the type 4 up there. So there's basically two types of rejection. The host versus graft rejection and the graft versus host rejection. So the host is the person, the graft is the tissue or organ. So host versus graft rejection, the person is fighting the organ, okay? The person is fighting the kidney that was just transplanted in them, and it's a host versus graft, which is, a, which is the most common. The graft versus host rejection is the graft is fighting the host. So the graft is fighting the person. And the best example of this would be a bone marrow transplant. The bone marrow fights the body because the bone marrow recognizes that the body is foreign. Okay? So those are the two different types of rejection. We need to identify it quickly. Failure of the organ is the most common sign, first sign. Treatment, prevention first. Always remember for these patients, rejection is always one step away. So we have to, they have to be compliant to, to prevent rejection. Immunosuppressive therapy for the rest of their lives. Um, they're always immunosuppressed because they're going to be taking medication that suppresses their immune system. So their graft won't fight them so their, their 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 organ won't fight them and 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 cause rejection so these people are always always immunosuppressed so they don't go in big crowds they have to kind of stay away from people wear masks you know when there there's outbreaks of different type of epidemics and stuff um so this is just the donor and the donor cell is the graft like the kidney and they put it in a person who is the host and then this is just somebody who is the patient or the host, and they look like they're having a little reaction in that little picture. The next is immunodeficiency, um, a diminished or absent immune response increases susceptibility to infections, right? So if we have a low or a poor immune response or no immune response, we're going to be much more susceptible for infections. There's two different types, primary and secondary. Primary is a defect within the immune system like genetic loss of one or more two lines of defense, born with this condition. Often they have greater than two infections of the same type in a year. This is like the boy in the bubble. This is somebody who's born, has a primary immunodeficiency, getting immunoglobins as a chronic treatment. The most common is a secondary immunodeficiency that we see, and it's due to a cause, due to something that's a Acquired during a lifetime, temporary, maybe they're immunosuppressed or immunodeficient because of stress, age, maybe they have an illness, maybe they're on medications that cause immunosuppression, like corticosteroids, which make them immunosuppressed because that's what they do, chemotherapy, which kills the cancer cells and all other cells around, including um, lymphocytes, blood cells, any type of blood cells. Or it could be an acquired permanent immunodeficiency, like somebody who has HIV and AIDS. Predisposed patients to opportunistic infections, which are infections that do not usually cause disease in a healthy individual. 
So somebody who's immunosuppressed or immunodeficient are going to be more prone to getting an opportunistic infection like yeast. Yeast is an opportunistic infection. When we have yeast in our body and we're exposed to it constantly, but our body can fight that. But somebody who's immunosuppressed may be more prone to getting a yeast infection, a fungal infection like um, a fungal pneumonia. So somebody who has a fungal pneumonia, here's a group right here who, who will commonly come in with pneumonia, pneumonias and it's because of a fungus. I mean, we've heard of bacterial pneumonias, viral pneumonias, there are fungal pneumonias, but again, those are opportunistic. Somebody with an immune system should be able to, to fight those, those fungal infections and fungal pneumonias um, away. Tuberculosis um, uh, can be an opportunistic infection. Somebody has TB latent in their body, they become immunosuppressed and that tuberculosis will activate. Diagnosis, measuring immunoglobin levels, white blood cells, and lymphocytes. Treatment, somebody might get some antibodies like IgG, IgM, different types of antibodies. A bone marrow transplant to get them more white blood cells. Reverse isolation precautions, which will protect, protect a patient from us or from others, so they have reverse isolation because they have a low immunity. Certainly hand washing, limiting visitors, and avoiding flowers which carry pathogens. At risk individuals for immune dysfunction, very old or very young, poor nutrition, somebody who has impaired skin integrity with wounds, circulatory issues, alterations in normal flora due to antibiotic therapy, that suppresses um, the, some of the bacteria that helps are good bacteria and yeast that, excuse me, are good bacteria that kind of helps fight different types of infection and somebody who is on antibiotic therapy could get yeast infections, chronic diseases, especially diabetes, corticosteroids for sure, chemo, smoking, alcohol consumption, and immunodeficient states. So these are just, just some broad categories of people who are at risk. Building immune strategies include increase, increasing fluid and eating a well-balanced diet increasing antioxidants and protein intake and antioxidants do neutralize free radicals um, so it is important to have foods with antioxidants getting enough sleep avoiding caffeine and refined sugar spending time outdoors reducing stress just staying healthy these are all just staying healthy um, me uh, methods and no can add to that not to overuse antibiotics because that certainly is something that could impair it replacement therapies for immune deficiencies um so immune deficiencies are rare and again they're 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 a rare diagnosis and they are difficult to diagnose sometimes it could take you know somebody who has a legitimate primary immune deficiency it could take decades before they are diagnosed they have they get sick and they have different complications um so these are just some some therapies and, and many immune deficiencies can be successfully treated by replacing what is missing. IgG or IgM um, injections, they get intramuscular injections of those. Fresh frozen plasma, sometimes people get regular um, administrations of FFP that does have some gamma, gamma globulins in it. Um, Transplantation and transfusion, bone marrow transplants. Um, if somebody has an immune deficiency, we can transplant somebody else's bone marrow that has these wet, white blood cells in it, monoclonal antibodies. So this picture right here, human immunoglobin therapies, immunoglobin, immuno, immunoglobins, aka antibodies, derived from plasma of healthy donors okay that's where that's where we get these the igg igm this one is given iv some of them are given some q but most of them are given given im so they can be given you don't need to memorize this somebody with hepatitis or they have exposure to hepatitis they can get some some administration of the hepatitis big which can be helpful tetanus immunoglobin if somebody's exposed prophylaxis of 
a tetanus infection with clients with traumatic puncture or contaminated wound. We get a tetanus vaccine that's going to fight the, the tetanus. Botulism, immunoglobulin, infant botulism caused by toxin type A or B. So we can administer these in people who have to need these to get replaced. Okay, that's it for chapter nine. And next we'll, we'll be doing chapter 10. Thank you.